Welcome on in here to Worldwide TV, your VIP viewing experience. I am Kayla Blakesley, and I host Northeast Indiana's number one news talk radio program. I also have the pleasure of being your host here today. I'm joined now by John Cruz. And for those of you who don't know John, he's a pretty special guy because he's auctioneer and owner of Worldwide Auctioneers. And I say that special, John, because yes, you are part owner, but you're also an auctioneer, and that's pretty rare. Yeah, in our industry, a lot of our uh, other uh, compatriots or competitors that have collector car auction companies, uh, there's a lot of great folks, they are not auctioneers. They don't get up and actually bid call. And so that gives us a, a little bit of a different uh, aspect of the business. And we think it allows us to be extremely vested in our clients in each and every car. Well, the reason we're here today on Worldwide TV is because we are bringing you the Scottsdale Auction in Auburn, Indiana. Okay, why are we in Auburn, Indiana? Well, we obviously are living in some unprecedented times. And a couple months ago, as we were you know, getting ready to make everything happen in Scottsdale, as we normally do every January, as, as a lot of folks do, we really had to pause and ask ourselves, what's gonna happen in January mm -hmm. during Scottsdale Car Week? Of course, none of us knew the answer to that at the time, but we, we really sat down and said, you know, what if, what if it's a problem? And we just didn't think we could ask our consigners to invest the time and resources to get their cars themselves out there with any chance that perhaps that wouldn't have happened. And so we had the opportunity to pivot with our marketing and, and communications with our buyers and so we said, hey, we're blessed to have a phenomenal, climate-controlled, huge, purpose-built collector car auction facility right here in Auburn, Indiana, and we can. So one of the reasons we made the decision, uh, in addition to thinking about our, our consigners, our clients, was that we do have this. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to pull off uh, some, some great events here this past year, so we knew we could. We talked to all of our consigners. Uh, every single one of them said, we're in. And we think that's great. Uh, let's, let's eliminate that as a possibility. And, and we love the facility. This will be wonderful. And as it's turned out, uh, that, that was a good decision because uh, now in Arizona, you're, you're not able to have big events. And uh, so we're, we're pleased to have done that. It was a risk, uh, but our clients were behind us. You know, we're behind them. And we're excited to be having a live auction here uh, this weekend, and I think it's going to be great. And for folks who are coming out this Saturday in, in the world that we're living in right now, this COVID era, I'm assuming here at Worldwide Headquarters, all precautions are being taken? Absolutely. We, we have uh, temperature checks. We provide masks for everyone that comes in. Uh, we have social distancing and sanitization stations. Of course, this facility, for those of you who haven't been here, is, is huge. So social distancing is super easy. Uh, but we also are providing uh, access through Worldwide TV uh, to be able to participate. Uh, and certainly anyone that wants to come out you know, between now and actual auction time, uh, if they'd be more comfortable, maybe it's just one or two people or three sure. people, they can do that private preview or they can have uh, someone that is coming in on their behalf to inspect a car. Uh, and we, of course, highly recommend and encourage that. It'd be great. Uh, but for those who are comfortable, uh, they can. You know, buyers and, and their guests can come here in person uh, on auction day uh, to participate. And we're looking forward to having a blast virtually with oh, our yeah. phone bidders and, and those that are going to be here in person. We're just getting started. I'm already having a great time. Uh, let me ask you this. You say access, you know, to the, to the Scottsdale auction right here in Auburn via Worldwide TV. What does access mean? Well, I think that um, we want everyone that perhaps because of the times we live in that, that aren't traveling or unable to travel, that they can participate at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. And you know, most everybody live stream things, so you can watch the action, but uh, we just believe that a little bit more uh, interaction and, and personal touch and uh, some early access, so before the auction, where we can talk about things like uh, inspecting cars or why this car is this or that, and, and really just uh, dive a little deeper 
and, and give folks uh, a little bit of a behind the scenes even uh, opportunity to see, you know, what's it like to get ready for a sale? What's it like to, if you're an auctioneer, what do you do before you hop up on there and start the sale? Oh, I can't and wait to ask a lot you of fun that. things like that. I might have to ask you for a little demo here at some point over sure. the next couple of days as well. Has it ever been done like this before? So this is this is unique in in having you know we're, we're calling it Scottsdale auction because we do it every year. Uh, so moving it to an actual different state, yeah. and then having a live event that obviously has a lot of virtual mm -hmm. aspects to it. So the way we're doing it, uh, I don't think anybody's ever quite done it just like this. Uh, so everybody participating, you're you're part of something that's not been done just like this before. Uh, so what other features besides Travis can we look forward to? Well we're gonna have some really neat uh, special guests that'll be talking about the marketplace, hmm. be talking about specific cars and uh, so we're looking forward to the slate coming up. I think our viewers are gonna be intrigued and it'll be a great time. If a buyer still wants to get in on, the, on all the action, can they do that? Is it too late? Oh, absolutely. It's not too late. Okay. Uh, you can go to WorldwideAuctioneers.com and, and scan through the different ways to bid, which you, know, you can bid in person, you can bid by telephone, you can leave a written or absentee bid, and then we also have a lot of the inventory on our partner online platforms. There's three of them, so you can bid on the internet, you know, phone, again, written bids, or you can be in person. Uh, so visit the website. Our client services team would love to walk everybody through that. And for those who do participate remotely on any of those uh, different platforms or processes, uh, we'll be able to still communicate with them if they need additional photographs or information beforehand so that when they bid, they're ready to go. Okay, well, speaking of that, how do I get registered then to do the bidding? So you can register right on online? the website. Okay. Uh, and then you'll provide financial verification. So our team would then receive your registration, say, hey, you know, do some financial verification stuff. You tell them which cars you want to bid on. Uh, are there questions you have so the specialists can get back to you? And then you're ready to go. I know we're going to be talking about a pretty hot uh, F12 Ferrari coming up. I'm really excited about it. Uh, that's what I'm personally excited about. But what are you most excited about today? You know, I, I really love the 34 Packard that we have. It's, it's from the era that I appreciate the most. But, you know, growing up I had a poster in my room of a Dodge Viper. Mm. And oh. we've got some pretty special I think Vipers I saw that one already. So I'm anxious to talk about that one as well. Hopefully we can maybe get in, take a, take a couple of rides. I don't know if we Absolutely. can do that or not, but I guess we'll find out. Welcome on into Worldwide TV. I am your host today. My name is Kayla Blakesley. By day, I host radio. Today, I'm here hosting this for you alongside my, I'm going to call you co-host. Is that okay? Sounds great. My co-host, Travis Levine. Travis is part owner of Levine Restoration, one of the best restoration companies in the entire world. And we'll chit chat <laughs> with you in just a moment. But first, I, I truly want to welcome you on in here as we are gearing up for the Scottsdale auction in Auburn. That part is very important in Auburn because of COVID, Travis, we're not doing this in Scottsdale this year. That was a really smart decision, uh, you know, with, with what's obviously going on in the world and in the country right now, health is the primary concern here. So they decided to, worldwide has decided to move this uh, auction here into the lovely facilities at the J. Cruz Plaza uh, for a fantastic live auction that will be coming up. And what's so great is we're able to just reach people by the masses thanks to Worldwide TV. So I'm not upset about it. I, nor am I. Here's the deal. <laughs> I need you to get on up and move those legs because what I want to do, I want to walk around, check out some of the vehicles that we got here going on today, and we'll go, we'll go lot by lot. Sound good? Sounds great. All right, let's do it. All right, we're kicking things off with Lot 47. And Travis, because I cannot say the name of this vehicle, I'm going to let you do it. Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> so this is a 1947 Mercury Series 79M Marmon Harrington 4x4 station wagon. It's a Woody. It kind of looks like a tank. It does look like a tank. And the interesting thing about Marmon Harrington is they actually built tanks for the British Army for World War II. So I'm not tanks. totally off base by no. thinking that. Okay. 
The, uh, this car is incredible. There are only a handful of these that were built, and essentially what happened was is Harrington came in with Marmon Harrington, and Marmon Harrington started out as the Marmon Mortar Car Company. Harrington came in and had fantastic engineering prowess and was able to design a U-joint system that made four-wheel drive a lot more practical for the era. Okay. And what happened is Ford and Mercury sent handfuls of cars down to Marmon Harrington and had them build them. And as you can see, this particular example is done to the nines. It's pristine on the outside and the inside. Absolutely. And I can guarantee that the underside looks just as good as everything else that you can see here. I wore heels. You can crawl under. <sighs> All right. Well, we'll have to. I'll uh, Somebody call the hospital. Yeah. So just looking around this thing, you can see that this was clearly done to an extremely high level. And one thing while we're standing right here that catches mm -hmm. my eye is this little marking right here. This is Ford safety glass uh, markings. And what that tells me is that when Nick did the restoration on this, he went to every level of detail that he could. That is so difficult to find original mm. glass that has the correct etchings and everything else because you can't make glass in a restoration facility. And so for Nick to have gone through the trouble of getting those Fine. pieces here, is that just as a testament to the quality of the restoration. I look at those types of components and I just think, okay, this is, this is a job that was done with absolute authenticity in mind. So would you say that's pretty rare to find restorations like that? It's, it, it's not, it Thank is, you. there are tons of levels of restoration. It's not rare to do so, it's difficult to do mm -hmm. so. And it takes time and it takes money to do that. And it takes somebody that really knows what they're doing to know those details, all the research and everything that went along with it. And that all of that detail, to me, clearly presents itself with this. This is just such a fantastic, unique, really, really rare. This is the only one for this year. This is the only one. The only one for this year. So I look at this and I just think this thing is incredible. And the worksmanship and craftsmanship that went into restoring it is very evident to me. So or now are you going to get underneath and check out? I, OK, somebody can. Can we get a ladder or a step stool? I don't know what I'm going to need. <laughs> I'll but tell you what, we'll do it at the end and we'll, we'll move on and check out the next sounds one. Sounds good. All right, we got lot 48. This is like the car. This is the creme de la creme, Travis. Tell me all about it. So this is an 1107, so that means it's a 34 Packard Phaeton. This is a 12, which is a senior car. Packard's 12 cylinder engine was fantastic. Their engineering was fantastic from top to bottom. And the expression that they use, fantastic marketing of the era, was to ask the man who owns one or ask the woman ah. who owns one because there were lots of women that own these fantastic cars. I'd this, take one. This example here, though, is absolutely just phenomenal. Um, this is a car that, fantastic history that's known from inception. Uh, the car was owned and restored by some of the most notable people in the, in the hobby. Particularly on this car, this was restored by Fran Roxas, who Fran Roxas is kind of the OG of classic car restoration. <laughs> Uh, and Bob Joint was involved with this car and knows a lot of the history when the car was dropped off to Fran Roxas in the 90s, at which point in time he stated the car was a 90-point car. So with a restoration, to start out with a car that's that pure just makes the fi finished product that much better because everything here is original, down to the original cowl tag wow. on this car. Uh, the accessories on this are unbelievable, notwithstanding the fact that there are only five of these that were built. Whoa. So you have accessories on this car. Like what? What do you mean accessories? Uh, Tell me about them. They have, okay, so this is the only one built with a actual rear windshield. This, this is, is the only one? This is the only one. And the neat thing about this is if you think about, this is a drop top, right? This is the get out and have fun car. If you're sitting in the back seat, I don't want to touch it. this front windshield is doing absolutely nothing to keep everything from blowing the hair back and everything else. So this windshield was designed to actually make the rear compartment more enjoyable when the top was down for a drive. Mm. And I will say, if you sit in the back seat of a Phaeton, it's an experience. You really are just kind of hanging out in the middle Have of nowhere. Have you done that before? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> We've restored a lot of Packards over the years. So this is really something near and dear to my heart. But there are just some really fantastic features on this, especially with the senior cars, the V headlights, such a classic touch. And one of my favorite features on this car is the fact that they opted to go with what's referred to as the bale radiator cap. You would have a cormorant or some people would put, put what they call a Lalik crystal hood ornament on these cars to really dress it up. But I actually really appreciate the fact that this has a very understated look with the bale cap. It makes oh, the that's long- That's the understated look? Absolutely. It makes this whole long front end just really pop. Yeah. It's just a stunning car. Everything about this is just beautiful. And it also went out to a good friend of ours out at Stone Barn Restoration, Rich and Debbie Fass and Tim, their brother. 
uh, or Rich's brother, fantastic restorers, good friends of ours that we've known ever since we started, my parents did 46 years ago now. Went back out, did a mechanical and a cosmetic refresh, if my memory serves on this. It visited Pebble Beach for a second time recently. It was a Pebble Beach best in class like car. Like Pebble Beach, like near the golf the course? The Pebble Beach, okay. yes, the Pebble, the Pebble Beach. Beach. That is the World Series of classic <laughs> car shows. Uh, this car with the mechanical refresh by Stone Barn and the original, the absolutely, the original restoration by Fran Roxas. This really is just a fantastic car. You're not passionate about it at all? Not at all. I couldn't talk about this for days. Lot number 48. All right, let's see what else we can find. <laughs> Man, so a big difference from the car that we were just talking about to this baby. I feel like lot number 23 here is the one that would help you score all the ladies. <laughs> I, I don't think it would hurt, let's just say that. Not for you, of course, Travis, you're engaged, you're <laughs> taken, no I, ladies for you. Thank you, lovely fiance out there, not, not my car. Uh, this car is absolutely incredible. This is a 63 Corvette Restomod, <laughs> and obviously the dead giveaway on it with a 63 is the iconic split windshield mm -hmm. design, which I will say from driving, they are terrible to drive because you can't see a thing out of them. So it's fun for aesthetics, terrible for driving, which is also Travis, part of the that's reason. that's what it's all about, I, how you look in the car. I agree, and let's be honest, in a car like this, it doesn't matter what's behind you anyways. The cool thing about resto mods, and what's so interesting with these kind of cars, is it's very different than restoring a car like the 34 Packard. Why, Where because of the history element? Absolutely, you're following historical guidelines, you're following by the books, the part numbers, all of the research that goes into building the car so it is ex ex as exactly as it was when it rolled off the line. With the Resto Mod, you have carte blanche. A little bit more fun. A little bit more fun and all of your imagination. But the neat thing and the difficult challenge about building a Resto Mod or a hot rod is you're taking all these components and design concepts and, that are either made in a vacuum or designed in a vacuum, and you're taking them and you're trying to marry them to work together into a cohesive unit. And you're taking a look at what was the original design intent of a car and how can we modify that to a more performance oriented or modern bent. And that takes vision and it takes a lot of research and quite frankly, it takes a lot of money. I know for a fact with this, there's probably a half oh, a million. Oh, you're saying this isn't cheap? No, 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 no. <laughs> this is not cheap. I bet you there's a half a million dollars in this car. Wow. Uh, from the way the interior was done, which again, just kind of mimics and follows along with the original design intent to the color choices, to the Art Morrison chassis, which Art Morrison is kind of, again, an OG in the modified and hot rod community. His chassis are the stuff of legend. Um, fuel injected 350. I think this thing's probably around 345 horsepower, you know, disc brakes. So how fast could it go? Oh, I'm sure this car would do 160 miles an hour, no problem. Would be my guess. I don't know. I haven't driven it yet. I'd love to, but uh, probably not going to happen. We talk to somebody about that. I know the guy who runs it. I would like to meet him. <laughs> but this is just a totally different type of car and investment opportunity, uh, you know, project. Whatever your goal is with this, this is the imagination aspect of restoration. So when it comes to this car, say the Packard, what one would you rather restore? I am a diehard pre-war American car okay. guy. So for me, the history that goes into restoring something like that, you're touching on all the lives and all of the cool things that were going on in the country and everything else that were involved in that. With this, I do love this, and we've done a lot of pro touring cars, but for me, that's my jam, but I love this for the use of imagination. I like it. Let's go see what else we can find. I think we got one more lot to check out. Sounds good. Here we are, lot number 17. I take back my previous statement about the earlier car being the ladies' vehicle. I think this Viper might just be it. Uh, this is definitely something to behold. This is snazzy. This is snazzy is one way you could put it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's an incredible car. This is a 96 Viper GTS. Uh, this is a Gen 2 car. Uh, Viper came out in 92. Their whole goal was to kind of emulate the panache and everything that happened with the Shelby Cobra. Dodge at that point in time was kind of a bit eh, dated, maybe a little stuffy. And so this was a huge departure from what they had done from a manufacturing perspective. Uh, this car is just incredible. It's, it's a rocket ship. Uh, you're talking about first gen, the engines were making 415 horsepower, I believe. This second gen, they were making 450, and this is just pure unbridled power. Okay, when you say rocket ship, I drive a Jeep Car Cherokee. How, how does that relate to my Jeep driving experience with horsepower? Uh, well, first of all, this probably weighs far less than your Jeep, and this has at least double the horsepower, torque, you name it. Um, 
you know, this thing could go to the grocery store and back by the time you got in your car. Although I wouldn't really be able to fit any groceries in it. Can I get in it? I don't know how to work this Absolutely. Handle. Let me let you in here. Such a gentleman. Ah, oh, well, I'll let my mom know that. Gal. Oh, yeah. She raised her son right. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is fancy. Woo, baby. I mean, you wear this like a finely oh, tailored suit. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yep. I'll take two. Oh, I'll take have the two second. I'll have the yeah, second right? if I can. Wow. So the inside, I mean, everything. Tell me all about the accessories. What's going on so in here? So basically, the interesting thing about these is they weren't necessarily over the top on all of the accoutrements. No, it's they weren't a Ferrari and whatnot, but that wasn't their aim. It was truly Detroit <gasps> power. So it's got all the all the things that you would need, all the the you know the accessories. Essentials. It's got all the gauges you would want, but it's not over the top. So this is really just purely a driver's car. This, isn't this is a, a toy. This is a, it is a toy for some. This is a fantastic car, though. And truly, the fact that this thing is wearing just 22 miles in the original window sticker is unbelievable. Actually, one of these just sold on Bring a Trailer here recently for, with 17 miles, it went for 110,000 or 111. I'd have to check my memory Whoa. on that. So these are a car that appreciates, Whoa. and the fact that this is literally brand new. I mean, if you'd have gone to the Dodge What did you Dodge say, 22 lot, miles on 22 it? 22 miles. I mean, my car that I got new didn't even have 22 miles on it. The dealer clearly enjoyed it before that, so the fact that it's that low is unbelievable. I think this might be my favorite. Well, I, you're staying in line. I'm right there with you. A good note to end on. <laughs> All right, Travis, I need you to get comfy and cozy because I, what I want to do is take a moment and, you know, and just talk about the quality of restoration in general, in particular when it comes to the four vehicles that we looked at. But before we do that, there's my little teaser for you, so hang tight. <laughs> before we do that, just tell me how you got into the, the restoration business to begin with. Uh, it's definitely genetic, we'll say that. Uh, it started out with my grandfather actually worked for the Studebaker Corporation for 35 years. Uh, and my dad and his twin brother used to build cars in their front yard. They had an Electrolux attachment to be able to spray cars. My mom also was a gearhead. Uh, brilliant lady, fantastic with cars. She's probably forgotten more in her life than I could ever hope to learn. The two of them actually got married and started our restoration facility, Levine Restorations, 46 years ago. We're actually on our way to 47 years. And through that time, they've restored some of the finest cars in the world. We've won best in show at Pebble Beach, two dozen best in class. We've had pro touring cars. We've taken to the Detroit Autorama and had grade eight, which is a big deal in that world. We've done everything from Delahays and Delages to Packards and Duesenbergs. Well, you bring up the Packard, and I want to talk about that uh, for a brief moment with you because when you're out there and you're talking about the Packard, and you brought up a lot of history, and at least what I get from you, and I'm sure for, or for many of our buyers out there right now, it's not so much just about the car or the restoration, but it's about that preservation Absolutely. of history. Absolutely. That's really a neat feature about restoring a car. And, and we talked about this briefly beforehand. Car, these cars are truly pieces of art. And we socially and as a culture really appreciate the pres preservation of art, correct? These cars being art, when you go in and you start to restore, you are doing the exact same thing you were doing as if you were restoring a Monet or a Degas, or you're, you're a, a curator mm -hmm. of the arts or an appreciation of the arts. These cars are truly a snapshot into what the world was at that point in time, what was going on with you know, socioeconomic issues, what was going on culturally with design. Uh, the preservation aspect of that really susses out some just incredible history and it gives these cars a soul because as you go through restoring one of these cars, you get to kind of touch on all of these pieces that so many hands and minds and hearts poured themselves into and you get to experience that and it almost kind of imbues part of that into you it's as you special. go through it. It is. It really is a it's almost a, a dance. It's it's it has a bit of romance to it and I think that's extremely special. You're clearly not passionate about not it. Not at, at all. all. I just not at all. On this theme of reservation or uh, restoration and the quality of restoration, when it comes to folks doing um, restoration projects at home, what would you say could be maybe some of the downfalls or pitfalls of doing that? <laughs> home restorations are always difficult professional restorations are difficult you know this is not an easy thing to to task uh, to take or to take the task I should say you're talking about a car can have thousands and thousands of components um, so when you go into doing a restoration having a game plan at the outset is extremely helpful Something as simple as where are you going to store all of the parts when you take it off mm -hmm. the car? How are you going to catalog things? Have you done the research? Um, I think doing a home restoration is again a very, very 
just fulfilling experience. And it really, you, as you go through it, you learn so much. You learn so much about the car and the process, but you learn a lot about yourself too, because it's a very frustrating, but very rewarding thing to do. So having those things planned ahead of time is very helpful. I'm just curious, on average, and I won't hold you to the number, Travis, but on average, how much would you say it, it costs to restore one of these beauties? Oh, it truly depends on I, a multitude of factors. If you're taking it to, uh, you know, true to original form, you can have hundreds of thousands of dollars into a restoration without blinking an eye. If you're Ooh, doing it- Expensive hobby. It is an expensive <laughs> hobby. But again, you aren't, it's not just a hobby. This is a preservation yeah. of history. And, and that's, that is the beauty in all of this. Well, that leads us perfectly into lot number 47. We were, uh, we were looking at it there, the uh, Mercury series. Now you're gonna have to say the name for it. You know so, I'm gonna box so it. It's a Series 79 Marmon Harrington 4x4. It's a, it's a Woody station wagon. That particular car is, um, just incredible. Uh, Nick Alexander did the restoration on it. We've seen his work before. Very, very highly regarded with this type of car with Woody's. Um, and walking around the car, that shows. The quality of the restoration is spectacular. Um, it is period correct. It is extremely well done. The craftsmanship in the restoration presents itself in a way that it doesn't overshadow the craftsmanship of the car itself. It's just done well. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the glass? Because when we were when we were talking about that vehicle uh, prior, you were just a little bit giddy about the glass uh, <laughs> in that vehicle. Can you speak to that a little bit? Glass is always difficult with a restoration. You, you can make almost anything, but to make glass, to, to do these panels and have the correct Ford safety glass etchings that are on that, that's not something that you can just make as a restorer. So for this car and Nick to have found and preserved this glass and the way, I mean, it looks fantastic. That is a mark, in my per opinion, perspective of a fantastic restoration. Um, that's, going, that's going the extra mile. That's going far and beyond what a lot of restorations do because this is a one of one and it merits that type of attention to detail. Well, I was actually just gonna ask that. Do other uh, restorations not normally go that extra mile with the glass? Just like anything else in life, there are, there are tranches. There are layers and levels of a restoration. And whatever your goal is, that's perfectly fine. If your goal is to do a full on 100 point Concours level restoration, this car being a one of, it merits that, or one of six built, one of this for 47. I mean, it's the only one, so doing it all the way, you've now created, in my opinion, this fantastic time capsule that will far surpass our time here. And since it's been done to that level, 100 years, 200, from, 200 years from now, somebody will look back and say, wow, that's exactly what that 47 Marming Harrington was when it rolled off the line. And that's incredible. Is it safe to say that the glass is your favorite part of that restoration? If you had to pick your favorite, oh, it, what would it be? I, Can over, you pick a favorite? I, I don't know <laughs> if I could pick a favorite. I mean, truly, the, the, the stance on it is incredible. It just looks tough. I look at those things and I just say, yeah, that's somebody that's really put in the work to the attention of detail. And I tip my hat to that. I know that's not an easy thing to do and it really shows. So to say any one thing, I think the total package is really just pretty incredible with that. You were also really give, giddy about the Packard, the, the <laughs> uh, lot number 48 there. And why that excitement over that vehicle? Packards for my family and our shop are near and dear to our hearts. We've restored 35 or almost 40 senior Packards uh, and juniors some over the years. We've taken a lot of Packards to Pebble Beach. We've taken a lot of Packards all over the country. Uh, we have Packards that'll probably be in the UK this year. We are very big Packard people. And to see this type of Packard, 34 is regarded by many as the pinnacle of Packard design. There was a book that Ed Blen wrote called The Magnificent Packard 12. Just everything about this car just screams engineering and styling. Uh, this is Great Gatsby on wheels. Mm -hmm. It is just beautiful. The car itself is incredible, but also knowing who was involved in this, the fact that the provenance is dated all the way back to the car being new, the individuals that were involved in the restoration, the ancillary characters that were a part of that process who have you know fantastic reputations, all the all the fixings, I guess, are there mm -hmm. to really just have this incredible car that has, you know, fantastically vetted history, 
is historically significant and is just downright gorgeous. It goes back to that preservation uh, Absolutely. of history. Absolutely. Uh, for folks who have the catalog, this this is the car that on is, the cover of the catalog. Yeah. It's the creme de la creme. You know, you mentioned when we were chit-chatting about, about a lot of the accessories. You know, what makes this particular restoration so special with all these uh, accessories and whatnot? The fact that the car was actually ordered in period with these accessories is incredible. It's one thing to do a restoration and go back and put a, a, available accessories on and Packard actually had catalogs that would delineate what hmm. the accessories were that were recommended for that. And there were makers that did things that were not particularly sponsored by Packard that you could do, but the fact that this car, there's record of these accessories being done in period, that's pretty incredible. That cool. And that goes back to the research and the history and really checking into all the documentation on this. That's unbelievable, and that's the stuff that really wets my whistle, I guess, so to speak. All right, so when it, when it comes to the Packard, what's your favorite part of that restoration? Nothing, nothing compares to a Packard engine in my eyes. I know Duesenbergs are incredible, and we've done some, and they're... Uh, they're and there's a lot of people who might, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sure, but I, just the aesthetics of it, the balance, nature from side to side, since it is a V configuration and just the way it was put together it wasn't just fantastic engineering it was beautiful design uh it's just gorgeous the interior is impeccable in it the the steering wheel and the correct grain patterns on it i mean i could truly go on and on there is not a single component on that car that was not thought out there was no designer that just said Eh, let's do this. Every single aspect of those cars was thought out. Does that even happen when we're talking about all of this money and all of this time? Eh, let's just do that. That doesn't happen, does it? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Lot 23, let's talk about the Corvette. That is one sleek looking car. And I, I want to point out, and we, we can point out this uh, throughout the, the coming days as well, that's no reserve on that Corvette. That is. So if you want this puppy, you're going to have to, you know. <sighs> you can't. <laughs> To, you you wouldn't you will not <laughs> I don't even know where to start on something like this. Looking at the details on this car, we've built a lot of pro touring cars mm -hmm. I mean, at, at high levels and mid levels and things like that. And to to walk around and see the quality of the work, there was a lot of money put into this car. No no qualms about it. That's just the reality of it. And to know it's a no reserve car and to know that somebody else put their money into it and then someone designed all these components to work together and, and came up with a really beautiful package and obviously a beautiful car being this you know, split window 63. Mm -hmm. The car is fantastic. Uh, I, I honestly... You're speechless. I really You're almost am. speechless. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm visually going through the design elements on that car and looking at the way that the, the builder tried to capture the original design intent of, that, of the era and then modernize it. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's really a thing of beauty to sit and think about how can we translate the original design intent into modern terms. And I think that car really was very well executed with that. It was done clearly with a, an aim for luxury with the burl that's done mm -hmm. on the dash and the leather interior and the iPad that's the, the infotainment system. It's just sleek. I didn't even know it had all that. I, I, you, I see it. I see this stuff. It <laughs> sticks with me. It's really pretty incredible. Um, so the car is just very well done. It's beautiful. It has the right stance. It has the right rims, the right color, in my opinion. I think it's gorgeous. Any corks to the restoration that you might not find normally on a Corvette? I, since this has all modern components in it, the, a lot of the quirks of a 63 split window are removed. Um, so on something like this, since it has really been engineered from the ground up and won all these awards and whatnot, you know it was put together well, I would, I would assume, <laughs> based off what I know. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I really couldn't say, you know, speak to anything that I would say would be a quirk on this because the car really has been redesigned from the ground up. All right, last but not least, my personal favorite. We've got to talk about Lot 17, the Viper. Ah, yes. What makes this one special? What doesn't make this one oh, good special? Point. Good, good uh, point. I mean, that, this was a poster car for me when I was a kid. So there's that. Uh, obviously, that in and of itself raises the value of the car. But this really is a fantastic testament to American muscle, to, to Detroit, you know, no holds barred, no frills, engineering. Um, 92 was the first year for it, 96 was the first year for a revision. The GTS has ended up actually becoming the platform for a Le Mans winning GTS. Mm -hmm. uh, this was tr basically uh, a, an attempt to kind of build a rocket ship for, for Dodge. They are an incredible car, they're not very frilly. 
They are everything that you need to go fast and drive and not a lot beyond that, but they are beautiful, just beautiful cars. And the fact that this has 22 miles on it, that's unheard of. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable. I, I deal with old cars, so the thought of if an original car has 50,000 miles on it, that's just like, huh. And to see 22 miles on this car with the original sticker, I, it's, it's a brand new car. So that's rare. I mean, it's, will, you, will you find it anywhere else? There was one, I think I'd mentioned this earlier, that sold on Bring a Trailer here recently that had 17 miles on it. And ah. That was a $111,000 car. They might exist out there, but if they are, they are few and far between. All right, kind of to wrap up, we've kind of went through everything. Uh, when it comes to, to these particular cars, what do people need to think about and consider when buying? Do your homework. Um, that is point number one, is if there's something that you have your heart set on, be an informed buyer. Go to the document station, call around, get a hold of the experts, give us a call. We talk to clients all the time that are looking at cars that want a pre-purchase inspection done. Do we know anything about the history? Do we know who did the restoration? Do we have any information on where it's been? Uh, that really is the foundation for a great buy. And at the end of the day, you really are buying passion. You're buying mm -hmm. art. Um, follow your heart. I know that sounds corny, but I look at these cars and I see literally all of the history involved in them. And I can't, I don't think that makes any one car for me be more special than the other. And I think that's incredible. And so for anyone to come in and say, I want this one car, I have my heart set on this, that's really a thing of beauty. And in order to do that and feel good about it, I really implore people to research, take the time to do that. It's not a small expense, but you are gonna end up, if you buy what you really hoped you would, that's a feeling that you'll never experience. So people need to do their homework though. Absolutely. Overall. Well, here's the deal, you've done a great job. I'll let you get up and stretch your legs with me and uh, go check out a few more. Sounds great, thank you. Okay, let's start with the cord, lot 68. Take it away, Travis, you're getting so good at this. <laughs> so this is a 1936 Cord 810. Um, this is, honestly, this was such a groundbreaking design at the time that a lot of people didn't like it when it first came out. Why? Um, a lot of things are very different for this car compared to the Packard that we discussed earlier. First of all, this is a front wheel drive car, which is super unique. Uh, 36 and 37 were the last years that a front wheel drive car was produced in America until the 70s with, with I believe was an Eldorado or maybe I'd have to check my numbers on that. But this was a groundbreaking design to do a front wheel drive car at this point in time and the construction of it facilitated the removal of running boards. So you'll notice on a lot oh, of these cars yeah. they have running boards yeah. because of the way the car is sunk into the chassis on this because this is a unibody design from the cowl back, the car was actually able to sit lower. They were able to, with the redesign from the L29, which was the first car produced in the US with front wheel drive, they were able to shift the weight distribution back, creating a really super nice driving, really low, very sleek, and honestly, extremely sexy car for the era. Who would have driven this car? This was a car that actually was priced relatively competitively compared to other cars of the era, specifically for what you got for the value of the money. Auburn, Cord, they were really good about that. Auburn at the time was honestly probably the best value buy for quality out there, and Cord was right in line with that. Um, the car is spectacular. Obviously, this being a drop top, it looks the part. Mm -hmm. um, and this particular example is a fantastic example of a good quality cosmetic restoration recently, some uh, mechanical work to it, just a fantastic driver. This is something that if I was coming to the auction and looking at this car and looking for a driver cord or something that I could get in and be a part of the ACD club and do tours, this is, this is what I'd gravitate towards. Certain things were selected on this wisely to take a look at, like some of the cosmetics, obviously the mechanicals on it. You have to have a car that drives in order to drive it, right? Well, absolutely, last I checked. Yeah. And so there are certain things that were done on this that were just smart selections to take Do a look at. Do you want to get in it for you? Absolutely, it please okay. take Allow a look. Me. So you'll notice obviously this has a new interior in it, but some of the components of it haven't been restored yeah. because they are in a good enough shape that they were they're really great for what is a driver quality car like I the door sills cool. oh you well it yeah. fits you it fits you 
Uh, if you look at the door sills, for example, these haven't been restored, but you're going you're gonna to kick these sill plates every time you get in and out of this right. car. So if you're looking to do a driver quality car, that's a great thing to not really spend a lot of time on. Uh, but for what the car is, it's, it's really a fantastic example of you know, cord from the era and something that you can really get in and enjoy. This is a driving car. This is a driving car. This is something that if you wanted to get in this car and drive it out of this auction facility, you could do so. And that's really an incredible thing. Because some of these cars are done to a level where you're a little hesitant to do so. Um, all right, all, I felt like that about some of them. Like the Packard, I was scared to touch. This one, not so much. I well, feel like I could cruise around in it. And it's that was the beauty of these cars is it, just the scale of them. They are so much smaller than other cars from the era. It just makes it more inviting. I don't know what it is about it, but it's a very inviting car. Speaking of inviting, this little puppy over here, Lot 53, the Ferrari. we got to talk about this one. My first question for you, is it service, not service? So this is, I guess, define service, not service for Don't me Don't make here. me define these things okay. for you. You're the expert. Not so me. this car here is a car that is pretty much ready to go. Uh, okay. This is a car that's been recently serviced at a Ferrari certified service station. This is actually a car that came into our shop for some cosmetic work. Um, just something to kind of make certain areas commensurate with the age and look of the rest of the car. Uh, this is a fantastic example of a car, and to go back to what this car is, as I don't think we actually mentioned it, this is a 1985 Ferrari 308 GTS Quattro Valvole. So this particular, five times five. yeah, absolutely, that's a tongue twister. I'm impressed that I actually got it on the first try here. This is a fantastic example of Ferrari from the 80s. I mean, obviously, Miami Vice, mm -hmm. Magnum PI, like everything, everything about it is just a, you know, it's it's Magnum PI. Uh, this particular car, though. If I was coming to this auction and taking a look at this, I would immediately want to go to the document station. That's point number one every time. Take a look at what the car has for documentation. Mileage, provenance, service records, who's done the work, anything like that that can give you a full picture of what this car actually represents under the skin. Um, from there, walk around the car, inspect it. There are certain things to look for. Is there a ton of filler along the edges of the fender wells representing damage that's been done? Uh, is there very demonstrable changes in paint from the front to the rear or a door panel or shifts in color that would indicate that this has paint work done? If it has had paint work done, that doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. But why was it done? Mm -hmm. Was it wrecked or was it that there was delamination in the clear code or something along those lines. And so somebody wanted to come in and do some work to it. Um, so that's for folks, they're registered, they're ready to bid. That's their first thing they need to do is come into the document station. Absolutely. And another thing I would do is grab a specialist, hop in the car and start it up. Oh. Oh, Allow hop. me to hop in with you. Oh, come on do in. You, do you fit, Travis? Oh, oh, Woo, baby. I've been in this one. Go first. All right, keys. Let's see if we can pick the right one here. How many choices do you have? Oh, we've got a couple. Oh, we got a couple. We could be a while. All right. Now, is the battery hooked up? All right. All right. Now, let's see here. Oh. oh, snap. I mean, I think at this point in time, we should just take off. Yeah, up, up, down. You think well, we can do that? Oh, we're doing <laughs> Notes, you're driving as Travis Levine, not me. Oh, snap. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love my job. Love my job. Quick question. Can I fit my golf clubs in the back? Oh, it'd be tight, but if you really want to shoe them in like there. Driving up to the golf course? Well, this is a rear engine car, a mid engine car. So actually, your golf clubs would go up front. Oh, wow. all right. Yeah, so fun. I take my, put them in the backwards back. Exactly. Here's the deal. Let's go park it now over and talk a little bit more about car inspections. Sounds great. All right, Travis, as much as I enjoyed driving around in the Ferrari, <laughs> uh, we got to talk a little bit about car inspections. You know, what are some of the things I need to be asking myself prior to buying a vehicle? If you have your heart set on any vehicle before well in advance of an auction, do your homework first. Find out what are some key features you need to be paying attention to? Some of the pitfalls of a car, reach out to the clubs. Uh, if it's a Ferrari, reach out to your Ferrari club, reach out to AACA, find a historian or an expert on the mark and dig into what you need to know as you go into reviewing this car before you ever set foot in the auction. When you're here, go and inspect the car, spend time with it. 
use your senses, see it, look at it. I mean, good Lord, smell it if it's been running. Does it seem rich? You know, there are certain things that you can take a look at and find, you know, maybe issues that might be there. After you take that time to do that and you've done your homework, go to the document desk and really dive in. See what kind of paper trail the car has. Check the service records. See where work has been done. Anything along those lines that can make you the most informed buyer that you can be is going to make your buying experience and subsequent enjoyment that much better. Well, in the world of COVID, I mean, obviously, uh, we're, we're bringing this to you from Worldwide TV. If you can't get your hands on the vehicle and inspect it in person, what would you recommend for a, a virtual inspection? Same kind of idea. Do your homework beforehand. Call up the auction company, in this case Worldwide, get a specialist on there. Have a list of questions. Have them walk you through. Put a camera underneath the car. Take hmm. a look at what the underside looks like. Open it up. Have them start it. Walk them through what you want to see. And these are people that do this for a living, so they'll know what you should be looking for as well. They're here to help. Um, really just doing your homework and being informed so when you walk into that scenario you know what you need to do to look at to make you feel comfortable about the car that you might potentially buy. Okay so we checked out the Cord, we checked out the Ferrari uh, with your restoration expertise and we're talking <laughs> you know car, car inspections here. I want to go over both and your assessments of both. So let's start with lot 68 <coughs> which was the Cord. Uh, what do you think? The Cord is a, clearly has been mechanically refreshed lately. It's been cosmetically worked here. Some of the things that you can notice on it is clear. It's an indication that some work has been done. Um, from there, the car is, I would classify it as a really good quality driver. It's got a fantastic look to it. The Geneva Blue is a beautiful color scheme with the red interior. Uh, it's a fantastic entry into the ACD Club and having something that you can actually get in and enjoy. They're kind of two schools of thought, a car that you really drive and one that's more of a piece of art, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in this instance, I think that that Cord is a fantastic example of the former. That is a car that you can clearly get in and enjoy. It's tastefully done. It's well appointed. It, it could stand to have some work done in the future, but that's something that is completely up to the discretion of the buyer. You could get that car right now and enjoy it into perpetuity and have no problems doing so. And your assessment of lot, lot, uh, lot 53, the Ferrari. <laughs> the Ferrari is, again, a fantastic example of a Ferrari that you can get into and enjoy. As you um, did. As you did. <laughs> There's known service records on the car. It's been recently serviced by a certified Ferrari dealership. It's had cosmetic done work done. It has been taken care of. Um, and again, that's something where you can go into the records and take a look at and say, hey, yes, this is what we know about the car. These are the pieces of information that we can really suss out, and that makes me feel more confident that the service work that needs to be done, that's scheduled, has been done, and that certain items are in place, like the toolkit. Um, all in all, I would say that, again, is a fantastic example of a 308 GTS. It's, uh, I mean, obviously, it's a beautiful color. It's everything you would want out of a Ferrari. And it's a car that you can really get in and drive and enjoy as it sits right now. Let me ask you this. If you're a buyer ahead of this auction, if you had to ask yourself just one question, whether you're previewing it in person or inspecting it virtually, what's the number one question to ask yourself? <sighs> I'm really putting you on the spot. Here. Wow, the number one <laughs> question. I think a really good thing is to have an expectation. What mm. is your expectation? Where's okay. your cutoff point? Where's your break even point? Whatever that might be, whatever you want to call it, where are you comfortable to go to in buying that car? relative to what the market is, what else exists out there and everything else because, you know, there's there's nothing there's no worse feeling than buyer's remorse. Mm, yeah. So I think for me looking at this and dealing with a lot of clients, really having a plan going into it and knowing where that cutoff point is, that's a really smart thing to have. All right, great insight, Travis. I appreciate it. Well you're welcome. All right, and thank you for watching us on Worldwide TV. Don't forget you can preview all the vehicles right now at Worldwide Headquarters in Auburn, Indiana. Hey, it's Kayla here. I'm back again with John on Worldwide TV, and I'm really excited for this next part, John, because we're going to go check out this F12 Ferrari and wait until you see the paint job on this thing. 49, a 2014 Ferrari. John, this is a pretty uh, cool looking car. What makes this one so special? Well, this is a 12 cylinder Ferrari, and a lot of folks in the car world, when they think about Ferraris, they think that this is one of the best and most important milestone 
12 cylinder Ferraris. And the reason for that is obviously it's high performance, it's fast, it's a 200 plus mile an hour car. Oh, wow. But this is one of the very first uh, cars in the supercar Ferrari category that have a lot of modern technological advancements integrated into the car. Like, like what? Backup cameras and uh. things like that. I was a lot of suspension, uh, electronic suspension type things. But it is kind of the best of the past and the best of the future. And so the F12 represents a lot of what Ferrari is in modern times. If the past and present were to have a baby, this is what they, they'd come up there with. There you go. I can't help but notice her paint job. It's kind of this pearl, luster dust kind of sweet look to it. Is that, is that standard? It is not standard. This is a special order paint. Uh, and it's actually part of a laundry list of special options, closing on $100,000 over Ooh. sticker. So this is not just okay. your so average. I don't want to touch it. <laughs> well, you can touch it. You know, it's, it's, it's made to be driven and it's made to be in. But you know, this is not just an F12. It's a special F12. Uh, it has super low miles. It's had very careful attention and service. And but but as we just stand here and as everybody watching, yeah, the, the paint job. If you could just see it in person, it's I don't. It's incredible. It's like a luster dust, like it's a pearl. Absolutely incredible. So no reserve, how, how's this one working? Yep, this is selling to the highest bidder regardless okay. of price. If anybody ever wanted a Ferrari, this is one they should pay attention to. They might get a deal. Here's what I wanna do. Can we talk about that a little bit more? Cause I'm still a little unclear about the whole no reserve concept. Maybe yeah, take a seat and talk about it. Let's All right, do let's it. do it. It is, when we look at these cars, they certainly are, are beautiful, they're, they're powerful looking, but cars are made to be driven. And when you're in one and you experience it, that's when you start to recognize why people get so passionate about these cars, because they're just so fun to drive. I'm slowly starting to, to get it and understand the passion behind these vehicles. Let me ask you this, because you mentioned the paint job over there, and then we just kind of saw it mentioned again in that video. I mm -hmm. guess I didn't realize how rare and special the paint job was. Yeah, so like any production car, you know, there's basic colors, and if you want something custom or special order, then you have to pay for it, because yeah. that's a lot of process that that goes through. And so that's what this original owner decided to do. And obviously it stands out, which is what Yeah, if you want that unique, for. one of a kind Ferrari, this is the one to go with yep. for sure. It's really got all the bells and whistles. What would you say is your, your favorite part about it? Well, I think, that, I think that the fact that you've got a car that can achieve speeds of 200 plus mile an hour is, is pretty incredible. We're probably not gonna take it there but the fact that it could, so you're gonna be able to push this pretty much as much as you would be comfortable mm -hmm. doing, knowing there's more there it is incredible. We talked about it uh, for just a brief moment there a minute ago, but I wanna talk about it. Why is this such a big deal mm -hmm. that this car is offered with no reserve? Well, I think that uh, there's a few answers to that. The first one is rarely will someone sell a modern sports car like this uh, with the credentials that this car has at no reserve and uh, a lot of people view that as a risky decision we have a lot of cars you know 75 plus percent of the cars in this auction are no reserve and i have a lot of faith and confidence in the marketplace mm -hmm. you know you have a, a great car 
the the market knows it's here we've let them know that that's what we do as an auction company and we're going to let the buyers and, and when i say we you know the sellers doing that and we're helping deliver that message and so that it's a special opportunity there, it could be a great deal you know generally speaking uh we have a lot of you know informed buyers they know what they're looking at and they know roughly what they think it's worth but it's a lot more fun and exciting and you know again it could be a deal maybe you'll buy your first ferrari uh, that would be nice i don't know if my husband would be okay with me uh buying that but we'll see how, how he would feel about that with our pocket